Okay, good evening. I would like to give you a short presentation about empirical findings about how eye tracking can be applied in software engineering or especially in code reviews. And I would like to start where Kenneth has just ended. But first of all, we have a short look to the agenda of my presentation. In the beginning, I would like to give you just a short... Oh, okay. In the beginning, I would just like to give you a short presentation how eye tracking is already used in software engineering because there have already been a lot of publications and would just like to show you a short overview or a current state of research. Then I will take some time and talk about the Classroom project, which Jürgen has already talked about and give you some further information about it and then come to a point where it might be most interesting for you. Then I start to talk about our own empirical results we've got so far and I will show you the results of two studies and talk about the current study with C++ study, which is right now going on. And finally, we come to a conclusion what we have found so far. Okay, let's start with eye tracking and software engineering. As Jürgen has already said, software is getting more and more important in our daily lives. So we are using it in almost every part of our life. I think everybody right now is sitting here in a room has a smartphone with him. Anybody here who does not have a smartphone here tonight? No? So everybody has one here. Okay. I also think everybody here in the room is working with computers during their normal jobs. So, or is there somebody who never used a computer for work? No? I thought so. So just a rhetorical question. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this trend which we can observe right now that software is getting more important in our daily life will continue, especially with findings like we are autonomous driving car and so on. We are really using software every time. And Summer will also mention in his standard work that our modern society would probably collapse without the use of software because most of our infrastructure is already controlled with software. So we could probably not even maintain our current society as it is right now. For this reason, we have a high need for software which is on a very high qualitative level. So we have to make sure that software, because uh, before it is thrown to a market, is really on a high level and works in a reliable way. For that reason, quality assurance is also getting more and more important. And this is also the topic where we are mostly focused on, especially my PhD thesis, which is mostly focused on eye tracking in uh, code reviews. But to this I will come later. So right now, if we take a look at software engineering and think about a normal software product, uh, a normal software development, how this is carried out, we see that programmers have to work with different kinds and representations of um, code. For example, every project normally starts when you talk to your clients and get some notes, what they want to have in the program, what their software should be able to do based on these findings, normally requirements are formulated, which are then processed in a UML model, and this is finally working as some kind of blueprint. So what eye tracking offers us is to track programmers during all these stages. For example, we can track natural text, how programmers are reading their notes, they took in discussions with customers. We can see how we look at requirements. We can see how a UML model is viewed by them. And then we can also see how we actually do uh, coding stuff and carry out the reviews. Okay, if we take a look to the current state of research in eye tracking, you can see that the first publication regarding eye tracking code reviews was made in 1999 by Crosby and Solovsky. There has been a literature review back in 2015 by Jarof B. et al. And they found out that until 2014, there have been 20 publications regarding especially eye tracking and co-reviews. Most of these studies they have found for the literature review are focused on code comprehension and on debugging tasks. And what they also showed is that most of the stimuli used in these studies are using um, object-oriented programming languages such as Java. I think there was one study, only one study regarding uh, using C++. So C++ is right now not really well surveyed. It's the same with uh, procedural languages like C and so on. So there's still a bright uh, gap we have to fill in the next few years. But we can also see a growing trend. So 
with the better availability of modern and professional light trackers, you can see that the number of publications is slightly increasing and there are getting more and more stuff published. The most important findings they have found in our literature review so far was that reading code and natural text just as Kenneth already implied are completely different topics. So reading code and natural text, they might use the same characters, but that's almost everything they have in common. So reading code and natural text are completely different things and you can only apply a few reading strategies from natural text reading, but it differs in a significant way. What was also shown by them is um, that programmers are using certain reading strategies when they are, for example, doing certain tasks like carrying out a review or looking code up for, up for errors and so on. So we have special eye movements they show in different situations. And what was also implied, but right now it is not so well served, is that the reading behavior is, grow, um, is changing with growing experience. The more experienced programmers become, the more um, unnatural, I would say, is a reading behavior in regarding code is going to be. So, based on the findings of Sharafi et al., I did my own systematic literature review for my PhD thesis, and we can see in the time from 2014 to 2019, we have already 24 publications focused on code reviews and on eye tracking. So keep in mind from 1990 to 2014 we only had 20 publications and within the last six years we are already having 24 publications. So you can see research is more focused on this topic and there is a growing interest. And of course eye tracking technology becomes more available, it's better accessible and it's right now also more precise than back in the 90s I would say because Modern eye trackers are rather easy to operate and you can use it under, well, you can even use it here, like the one we have pulled up here on your left hand, hand on your left hand side. Okay, let's go to the classroom project. So what one of the biggest problems is when you're doing eye tracking research is you have to recruit samples and, well, doing a study takes quite a long time because you have to do every data collection person by person. So it's hard and quite time taking, I would say. To overcome this obstacle, we had the idea to set up an eye tracking classroom, which is, well, there aren't that many on earth. Kenneth, do you know how much there are right now around? Maybe there are five, six that are active. So worldwide we have five until six, which are right now usable for research. And so we had a big luck, like Jürgen said, that they get the VMBF funding and set up our own classroom at Regensburg. This one is operated by University and the OTH. And we have equipped it with, I would say, top of the line eye trackers, which were produced by Toby. We're using 14 Toby, I, um, Toby Spectrum 600 Hertz eye trackers. So this means if you're sitting in front of the eye tracker and reading something, this takes records with 600 pictures per second. So you can even track the smallest eye movements and really see, okay, even just micro saccadic analysis and so on, which is a completely new stuff in eye tracking research. So we are capable of, I would say the most modern standard right now. We are using the classroom mostly for simultaneous data collections. For example, if we want to have a larger sample, we can use all 14 eye trackers and do all the data collection simultaneously, which speeds up the whole process quite a bit, I would say. One of the more unique features we are currently working on is the um, streaming. So for example, you can stream the eye movements from one participant to another. If you think about programming, you can just stream the teacher's eye movements to the students who are sitting also in front of eye trackers. On the other hand, the teacher can observe how his students are currently doing, if they have some, some troubles with some construction in the code and so on. So streaming opens up a new world in eye tracking and we are looking forward to really use it more in studies. Okay, to the classroom right now, we, our main research focus is definitely expertise in code reviews. My PhD supervisor at the university is doing a lot of medical hygiene right now. For example, how bacteria are spread around hospitals and so on. And if you can 
improve it somehow so that there are less infections and so on. Another colleague of us is doing reading research. So I would say the classroom is already in operation and quite used a bit during the last few weeks. So it's getting popular at the university and we are looking forward for more research which is done there. Okay, let's go to our empirical results. Regarding eye tracking and code reviews, we have done three big studies up to now. So the first one was focused on, well, I would say it was just a first step into the whole domain of source code reading and eye tracking as a method. The next one was more focused on certain aspects of a reading behavior. The third one, which I'm currently working on, is more, for, is more based on these two studies and surveys how we can transfer our findings to new stuff and maybe to see if there are some generalization is possible. So we will see what the study shows. All of our studies are always designed as expert and novice comparisons. So we are always recruiting experts who are normally professional programmers or very skilled PhD students who are normally also doing a lot of programming stuff and are doing teaching of, for example, programming lessons. And the novices in our case are most of the time students recruited when they are able to get the code. For example, I have all visited V, C and C++ basic programming languages. So we are quite at the beginning and then we compare them. So in our first study, we had just the goal to understand how exactly programmers read and understand code. So it was just a basic step, a first step in this direction. And of course, we were interested in how do the experts and the novices differ. For this reason, we have designed an eye tracking study, which used an additional questionnaire to gather some demographic data, for example, something like how much experience do you have in um, programming? How much experience do you have as a professional programmer? And so on. We recruited 24 participants. 15 of them were novices, 9 of them advanced. As you can imagine, it's always hard to get the experts because they have quite good positions at their companies and it's really hard to get them somehow to our lab. It's always a bit of a struggle, I would say. In this study, the participants' task was to do a review of eight short C code um, examples. Six of the codes they have seen were erroneous codes and two of them were correct codes, which actually produce an output. If the code was erroneous, we should just give a short error description. So we should just tell us, okay, there is an error and this is, this is happening. It will affect the code in this way and you have to do something like this and then you can fix it. So just a short description of it. And if the code produced a correct output, we should just give it the output. Our research showed some interesting findings. So we have seen that our novices spend significantly more time in reading the code and less time in composing their responses. So if you read the answers which were given by novices and the answers which were given by the advanced and expert programmers, you can clearly see who is an expert and who is a novice. The novices just have written something like that, yeah, in line three there is an error, it will not work. We advanced programmers gave you a very detailed description and I would say, based on this description, another programmer could find the error easily and fix it without any trouble. So we invented, invested quite a lot of time in producing their answers. And of course, what we have also found out is that the advanced programs perform significantly better in both in terms of error detection and understanding the code. So we easily outperform novices and you can see there are a lot of experience related differences. But the most interesting finding you will see on the next slide, this is regarding their reading behavior. On the left hand side, the green one you can see is a novice during his first 10 seconds reading the code. And on the right hand side, you can see the expert. If you take a look on the novice, the reading behavior regarding the code is more like reading natural text. So the novice starts at the top of the code and reading it bottom down. He reads it from the left hand to the right hand side. I would say it's quite like reading a novel or something. So it's not really regarding the way how the expert is reading the code. If you take a look at the expert, the reading behavior is much more focused on skipping through the text. They try to get an overview where what is exactly located, how the code interacts. So they are differing completely in the reading behavior. 
Based on these findings, we set up another study. So we have done research in this time and found that there have been some publications regarding eye movement pattern in code reviews, which were described by Yuvano et al. and Sharafi et al. So we tried to replicate their study, but added more modern methods. So for example, we used eye trackers with only 30 Hz of sampling frequency. We um, haven't done retrospective interviews. So retrospective interviews are some kind of interview in which you show the participants their own eye movements and then they can comment on their own eye movements. They can tell you, okay, this part was very complicated, so I needed more time to understand it. Or we just tell you, yes, I looked a long time for it, but I was thinking about the football game yesterday and was not focused on the code. So this is something a novice will probably say to you, but actually it happens. Okay, in this case, we replicated the study described by Yuvano et al. We left very detailed instructions about the codes which were used in the study, and so we replicated it as detailed as possible. So we set up six erroneous C code examples based on their specifications and recruited a sample of 25 programmers. 18 of them in this case were novices and seven were experts. So the results showed us that we were focused on experience-related differences and we saw overall programming experience and professional experience have a tremendous influence on the performance of participants. The more experience, especially professional experience they have garnered, the better they performed in the study. What we have also seen is that the, program, the advanced programmers move in a more efficient and elegant way through the text, uh, the code. So we are moving well, more like uh, you have seen on the slides before. I will show you an output of the cases of the study later, but you can clearly see they can grasp information in a faster way. They do not have to read it quite often as a novice, so we read it maybe one time and then they have an idea how it looks. And in combination with a retrospective interview, we found heavy support for in the VR tracking data for the use of certain reading strategies as described by Yuval et al. So asked on the proceeding how we read the code, we advanced programmers can give you a very detailed description of how they normally carry out the review. So we tell you something like, yes, before I start reading the code, I perform a scan. So I just try to get an overview over the code, see where something is. Some of the advanced programmers even mentioned they are trying to set up a mental model. So when they know where everything is located, they do not have to look it up once again. So we read it maybe one time and then they know, for example, where what part of the code is located. They easily form a model during this phase. Then they have this model in their mind. They start with the error detection. Then you can see that the eye movements are getting closer. They are working more intensively with the code, looking up every detail for errors and so on. And what also defined the experts in the study was we are doing a third phase. Oh, sorry. Um, we are doing some kind of verification. When they have found the error, they look it up, maybe it may interact with other parts of the code. Maybe there was a second error included. For our novices, it is most of the time like, well, there is one error, okay, I stop it. Enough. <laughs> so we have not, have not in mind that there might be other consequences of the error, or there might be a second error. Okay, and regarding the eye movements, we have found this. In this case, you can see on the left-hand side the first 30 seconds of an advanced programmer, and on the right-hand side, you can see the novice. So as you see, the advanced um, programmer skips just... Um, we start off a code, code examples where we see, so this include and so on. We know there isn't much information here. We take a closer look later to it, but to get an overview of the code, we just skip it. And the advanced were able within the first 30 seconds to almost cover the whole code. When you compare it with the novices, you can see that the novice actually, well, by reading it once again like natural text, they start reading it at the top, read it from the left and to the right hand side, and then they proceed through the, uh, through the code. If you ask them if they had a strategy or something in mind, they will just say something like, yeah, well, I read it. And yes, we read it like novel, for example. Okay, let's go to the last study. Actually, we have some results for the study. This one is focused on C++, but due to a questionnaire and the experiment we might conduct this evening with you, I can't show you the results right now because I will prime you and 
this is what destroyed probably our whole data collection. So I can say we have found some interesting ideas. We have found that there are some different reading types in C++. We can see um, there are also, once again, experience related differences. And according to our expertise research, we think that this might also help to get an understanding for the types which are shown here in the study. Well, maybe some background information to the study. We have planned to publish it maybe in early 2020. My plan is to write a journal article about it and submit it in maybe March or something like this. All code examples are in C++ and we have already done 35 data collections. So it's actually for eye tracking a quite big sample right now. Biggest one we had in code reading so far. And well, what our goal is, we would like to examine and maybe transfer the eye movement pattern we found in C code reading to C++ and see are there any similarities, are there differences. And then we would also once again like to see does the experts and novice differ somehow? Okay, and let's come to the conclusions. So, eye tracking really helped us to get a deeper understanding for the cognitive processes involved in code reviews. So, when you ask participants in a retrospective interview and they tell you, yeah, this is complex and I always need a lot of time to understand, for example, how pointers work, you know, these are complex constructs and they have to put in a lot of cognitive effort to understand how it works. We have also seen experience related differences and very important for us, these differences are measurable. For example, the eye tracking data shows you the participant can grasp information faster, moves in a more efficient way through the code. So for us, this is very important because we can relate it to the principles of expertise research. And as Jürgen said, in the next step, we would like to process our findings and use it in a didactical way. So for example, one possibility might be the use of so-called eye movement modeling examples. And there are two options. You can use these models, for example, when you're teaching students and show them something like, yeah, um, these are the most typical errors in C and C++. For example, you are not looking at uh, comments if the comment is finished and so on. You are overlooking these backslashes in C, for example. So you can just sensible size them a bit for it. And on the other hand, I think this would be also very interesting. You can use it for the teachers. And while well, if you're doing something for 25 years, you might not be able to emphasize with your students and cannot understand why we even lack the simplest co-constructs and have problems to understand it. So it might be also good in a train the trainer approach in our opinion. But what we have also found is expertise research, eye tracking and software engineering is such a big topic and during the next few years there will be much more future research necessary. Okay, that was my presentation, some of the sources.